you fail to understand, then the same incredible terror that's menacing me will strike at you! Hello, and welcome to another beautiful sunny afternoon from Studio City, California. I'm just waiting for my associate, my dear friend, Karen De La Carriera, to arrive. She just needs a minute, and uh, then we'll get started. Uh, in the meantime, I have a couple of announcements. Well, I have one announcement. I'm, I'm running a, uh, a caption contest. If you go to the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, the community uh, tab on my page, you'll see a lovely photo. Actually, I'll preview it here for you. Here's a photo of me and Dave and David Miscavige. That's Dave's brother, Ronnie, standing behind him. If you would be so kind as to go to my community page and caption this, and think of uh, try thinking in terms of like uh, you know thought bubbles. My thought, his thought, you know, uh, uh, Norman's thought, etc. Uh, hello. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Goldie. Thanks for showing up here. Tina in the last 20 is here, and uh, I'm just treading water waiting for my dear friend, Selena. Fancy seeing you here, yeah. Just, I can't get enough of you. Uh, so any second we're gonna be ready to go. We have a, a, a Karen and I were having this conversation. Uh, let me get this off the screen. I can only tolerate looking at that for so long. Karen and I were having this very interesting conversation and we thought we would have it, we'd get you guys involved in it. So she's almost ready to go. Uh, big countdown here. Hey, Davey, I can see your bald spot. Well, mine too. I mean, this was in my early pre comb over days when my hair really started to thin. Then I was just like, screw it. I'm shaving the whole thing off because I kind of actually like being. Uh, but so anyway, Karen's here. I'm going to bring her on. And here we go. Karen, hello. Hey, Mitch. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey, Hi. hey can, can you do me a favor? Move a little bit to your left. Would you only I'm using this format only because I've been informed that um, the YouTube algorithm prefers this format over this other one, because apparently so many people look at these things on their phones. Oh, you have a better chance of getting it seen if it's like this. So I was just letting them know that you and I were having this conversation and that we really wanted to share it with them. So, but before we get started, for those of you who've been living under a rock, Karen, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, <laughs> I'm ancient. I <laughs> lived on the Apollo with Hubbard. I trained under him. I swallowed it all. Sometimes I wonder, did I have some kind of brain aneurysm? What? <laughs> this is the problem when you glum onto a guru. If there's one lesson I've learned, giving your existence to some higher authority guru, that just is a loser. <laughs> no more gurus for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Anyway. 40 years. I was in 20 years, almost 20 years in the Sea Org, uh, five and a half years at OSA as Heber Gentius assistant. I was his wife. And, uh, and I had a tendency to go from the top of the Eiffel Tower right to the River Seine. Boom! <laughs> that was it. <laughs> There's class 12, and then I was summoned to it, gold base and digging the ditch for imprisoned. I was a prisoner, so I relate to those who've been imprisoned in a cult, whether the Church of FLDS or Jehovah's Witnesses. I was a prisoner, prisoner. And that was a game changer for me. I woke up. So actually, they did me a favor. <laughs> I realized this is not what I signed up for. It was just a matter of time before I wrote it. But I stayed in. They had my son, my only child, right, as a seal. Right. So I stayed in, and I was a good girl. I attended the events. Right. I bought all their merchandise. I gave great donations. Good girl, because they had my son. So anyway, uh, many people know 
My son died at 27 years old at the hands of the cult that had blood on their hands. They wouldn't, they disconnected him from me and he didn't, a $20 antibiotic could have saved his life, the coroner said, but yeah. he had no mom and his dad, he was Jench, was in SB Hole all that. Right. So he had no dad, no mom, he was orphaned. Now, I could lie in a corner and sob for the rest of my life and just be shattered and st stuck in the loss. Or I could grieve, have my time, and then pick myself up from my boost bootstraps and say, you know what? I'm going to help other mothers in the world. <laughs> I'm going to help other people by revealing some of the dark secret places yeah mm -hmm. so so then i've been a whistleblower and i have something like 13 million views on my youtube channel in what 10 years it's over 1 million views 1 million people a year visit my channel i'm very proud of that mm -hmm. and you should be now you <laughs> 28 years yeah. of your life 28 years. You know, Karen, oh. I can, I, I, I'm going to stop calling it 28 years. I, I, okay. I'm just going to round it off. We'll just say three decades, 30 years. It's just easier. Yes. yes. And it really is closer to the truth. I, yes. And that's, that's an extraordinary, uh, and you're still alive. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I wonder, but yeah, I'm still alive. Very still much alive. Your good friend Danny Sherman died off. He he, he didn't did. survive. Yes, he did. He didn't make it. Was he older than you? Uh, actually, yeah, Danny was uh, uh, three months older than me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Danny Sherman was the speechwriter. Right. For her. Right. right. For, right. For Miss Cavage. And yeah. nobody could make a sentence go 185 words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to post a sentence, and it says absolutely nothing. He was quite, but he was yeah. a friend of yours. <laughs> very, yeah, for a while, for, especially back in the early days, uh, Danny was a very uh, close friend. He was best man at my wedding. Who? Uh, and yeah, we spent a lot of time together. We we lived in that little village of VIP cottages, which they, you know fondly referred to as the G's. The G's. After, yeah, mm -hmm. after the, that, by the way, if anybody's wondering, that stood for groundskeepers. It was where the, the groundskeepers at the original, uh, at the original resort lived. And, you, you know, the Scientology is just, the or, organizationally, they are obsessed with, um, you know, abbreviating everything and turning everything into an acronym. So, you know, <laughs> if I would stayed a little longer, my name would have just been M because it was just like, they often called people by the first letter of their first name. Mm. So I would have been Mr. M, which is that's really mm. weird. But yeah, so I was very good friends with Danny. And uh, I, so that kind of brings us into this, uh, this subject that you and I were discussing, which is this caste system. Because, you know, Danny and I were considered VIPs, uh, you know, because we worked closely in Hubbard. We worked in the, you know, we were both part of Scientology's global propaganda machine, you know, for many years. Uh, thought we thought we were doing good work. We thought we were doing the right thing. Uh, and then we were sort of very high above what I refer to as the retail level, which be, would be the, the level at the local churches where mm. people were, you know, selling, you know, the, mm. we were sort of, it's not a great analogy, but we, we were the, in the corporate offices, those guys were in the, you know, they were, they were serving up the burgers at McDonald's and we were working at McDonald's corporate figuring out how to fool people into eating more burgers so and and convincing them the burgers were good for them that's just a terrible analogy i'm sorry anyway you and i were discussing this caste system uh mm -hmm. which, which is this very segmented culture that Sci scientology presents itself as being kind of very open and democratic and everybody's equal but in in fact nothing could be further from the truth and I know you've experienced that, Karen. Mm. Um, Ooh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it has to do with like, there's a bunch of different, there's a bunch of different, okay, so you have, here's one angle on it. You start at the bottom, 
and you have your, you know, the W word people. I'm not going to say it because in some parts of the world it's actually the same as the N word. But you have those people which are also known as humanoids or raw public. These are people that aren't in Scientology. And then above them you have people who have realized that they are eternal spiritual beings. And they're they're moving, uh, taking a step on the bridge, right? Uh, it's not unlike... Uh, say a Christian faith or a person has accepted Jesus to be their savior. I mean, deciding that you're a spiritual being and you're going to move forward in the bridge is, is the equivalent in another language of accepting a savior into your heart so that you can live eternally. It's really no difference. It's the same con game people have been running uh, since the dawn, the dawn of time. Uh, so then let me see above them, you have, who do you have above the public Scientologists? And then understand these are segmented like, your Scientologists are segmented by money, celebrity, where they are on the bridge, their level on the bridge. These all contribute to where they fit in to this caste system. And then at the uh, up at the top, you have the, you have the super donors, and uh, apparently my dog needs a treat. You have the super donors, the people who who give tens and tens of millions of dollars, and you also have the kind of A-list celebrities. Many of them also happen to be big donors, right, Karen? They happen to be uh, amongst some of your big donors. And then above them, you have, uh, uh, you know, the really big celebrities. Of course, the big celebrity of them all is Tom Cruise. And then above them, you have David Miscavige. And so it's like a caste system. It's like it's, people are treated accordingly. Uh, right? And you've seen this. Yeah, very, very much so. I think people will be curious as what on earth, who, who would give tens of millions of dollars to this? We need to clarify what on earth is wrong with people to give any cult tens of millions of dollars. I can explain because I was in tech so long that the counseling part of it, why? Just very, very quickly. When you finally sit down in a very private space, you think it's private, you're on camera. Every word you say is being recorded. Every word you say, counselors are trained to write down very, very fast. So you're on record, your deepest, darkest secrets, your sexual fantasies, everything is on camera, recorded. And Mark Headley, your dear friend and my friend, said um, that Miscavige has wired it in such a way that no matter where in the world he is, he can plug in and he can actually look in any session. David Miscavige could be listening in, in any session, no matter where you are. You can be in Johannesburg, you can be in Sydney, Australia. So you thought it was private, but there's something special about being in a bubble of just you and one other person whose entire presence is to listen to you vent and give up your, your thoughts, your private thoughts, your secrets. Your, and you're asked very clever questions sometimes. And certain amount of people have a rush and a high, spiritual high. It's not any drug, what's that drug, Ashkenazi or some <laughs> Latin America. There's some... Yeah, yeah. Ashkawanda, something Ash, like that. That's it. This is not taking that and getting it. This is just pure revelation of identifying who you are. Why did you react that way? What? Just inner revelations of you. And people get a high. And you know what? they get addicted to that. They think, mm -hmm. wow, if I got this high, right down here in baby auditing as an intro, get what will I get if I go up to OT8? Right. None of the exorcism or anything is revealed at this time. But it's a hook. And people will do anything to keep getting a spiritual high. Therefore, this is the rolling back why they give more and more money, more and more money. It's to get that high, which 
anybody tries to recreate a high. Why do people go back to Vegas? They won $3 million in a slot and they go back, they go back. They want that high of the win and they give it all back to the casino. It's trying to get that moment of delicious release. Anyway, that's just a little bit way yeah, off, yeah, tra uh, off track there. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, but that, that's fine. You know, I also think just if I can add something to that, that I think that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of trickery that's done to estimate the condition, the so-called condition that you're in, hmm. right? And and hmm. there's a lot of indoctrination. Like I hmm. know, before hmm. you do any auditing, you're hmm. going to be indoctrinated. You're going to be told a lot about the auditing you're going to get. You're going to be told what to expect in the other and you're going to be told what the end result's going to be. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of this anticipation. And then when you get into an auditing session with an auditor and an e-meter, mm -hmm. the, the auditor keeps you really focused on that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this fiction begins to build and then mm -hmm. you begin to believe that that's who and what you are. And then basically you have two people, an auditor and this client, mm -hmm. and they're both kind of gaslighting themselves into believing this reality. And I've heard auditors say, oh, I've seen people change before my eyes. And I've heard people say, and I went mm -hmm. through such transformation. And it's literally like this weird biofeedback that goes on between two individuals who are literally gaslighting one another. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing. But you had some some specific questions that you wanted to bring up about yeah. my experience. And, yeah. Mm, one last and final comment. None of those highs last any length of time. No, that's why you keep going. Transitory. Yeah. You keep going. You go back to the reds, you buy more auditing, and they're like, you know, yeah. the next day you feel bad and you want to know why, and they tell yeah. you that yeah. it's because you're bumping into your next level yeah. above you. You have to keep going and yeah. going and going. That's the con. Anyway, to me, you know, I'm Scientology is is maybe the most successful con in the last hundred years because they actually get people to pay them to actually extract their core identity and replace it with a fictitious a fictitious identity. And it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, and my this, dog agrees. So <laughs> this caste system goes to the point where you must call a female sir. Right. That... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everybody gets called sir because it's essentially it's a patriarchal construct. It's it's even though there's opportunities for women, right? In 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 the sea work, there's a lot of women in places of power, but it's still a completely man's world to the point where you have to call everybody sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see my dear friend Chuck Beatty in the in, in the in the chat. There's there's a guy who's been for at least 15, 20 years has been given. And Chuck did the RPF at gold for seven or eight years. Wow. Anyway, uh, yeah, there's hello, Chuck. Hello, hey. Chuck. Hey, Thanks for Chuck. joining us. Yes, yes, my dear friend. Okay, so I think I derailed your, your next. You oh, know, no, 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 you, you have questions about this. Well, you flew on Tom Cruise's private jet with David Miscavige. I think it was his jet. He wasn't on there, but I know his pilot, and it was his pilot flying right. the plane. So, I, I mean, I, I do think that it, Tom gives uh, Dave the keys to his jet when he needs a little extra transportation. So, Therefore, I wanted to ask you, sure. would, you be willing to, would you be willing to discuss Tom Cruise? I got yeah, some... I mean, to the degree to I can. I mean, I, I'm not... Uh, you know, I didn't know Tom that well. I interacted with him a lot. Most of my interactions with Tom were, they were, I mean, come on. I was introduced to Tom as, oh, hey, Tom, this is the guy that does our films. So I had taken those the films from being just unbelievable, laughing, the worst crap anybody had ever seen, and I'd made them into decent films. So I think this was a big deal because I know that when, when Dave first became friends with Tom, he was running around kind of crazy trying to make everything look good you know, so that it would be uh, a suitable for a person of Tom Cruise's stature because he's a, you know, he's an ex expert filmmaker. He's uh, obviously, he's wealthy. He has very good taste. Uh, wh whatever taste isn't natively his, he certainly could afford to, to have people instruct him on what is good taste because, you know, that kind of something that happens to all of us a little bit. Uh, so I think I was part of that, 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 uh, that paradigm of people who were making things more 
or acceptable. Uh, so Tom didn't have to watch these horrific films. The same thing with the orgs. I mean, that was part of Miscavige's motivation. I mean, I, mean, I know that personally because he said, like, you know, Tom can't bring his people into these horrific buildings. It was part of, not the whole re rationale, but it was part of the ideal org scene. So um, you have to understand that was kind of my relationship was sort of at that level. Like, I didn't work in his household. I didn't, you know, I flew on his jet. He wasn't on his jet. I've had dinner with him at St. Hill. I, 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 you know, in 91, when he was living at Gold doing services training, he was, you know, and Nicole would come and go. They were living in a cottage next to me. I'd see them. We'd say hi, da, 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 that kind of stuff. So I, I always found Tom superficially to be the guy you see on television when he's like the, on the red carpet. He's very polite and cordial and, and he's kind of, can be like uh, so enthusiastic and intense that it can be a little hard to take, but he's, I always found him to be a really likable guy. Now I've heard all of these stories. I know how he treated uh, Bonadine Nazar, I can't pronounce her name, the beautiful Iranian actress mm -hmm. that he was hooked up with. I've heard these stories. They're all very credible. They've all been told to me, relayed to me by people that I 100% trust. I don't doubt any of those stories. It's just that I can only tell the part of it that I know. So, you know, and I do think Tom is one of the biggest victims in Scientology. Sure, he has his own stuff to be held accountable for. But I, I you know, you hear this stuff like, oh, you know, people ask, uh, hey, if something happened to Dave, if he stepped off the corner, and got hit by a bus, so would Tom take over? Is he like number two? You know what I'm talking about, Karen? And it's like nothing could be further from the truth. He's not number two. He's the number one gaslighted victim in Scientology. And, mm. and, and, you know, he's like, he's the top guy who's siloed more than anybody else. I mean, this is the power of, of David Miscavige's organization and his reality distortion machine. And sure, they're buddy-buddy, and he gives millions and millions of dollars to this, you know, this, 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 cult that breaks up families and traffics children and and yes he needs to be held accountable for that but you know don't think for a second that tom cruise is in on the con and is like you know having those meetings with miscavige where they're going okay so what do we do next to take over the world now nah, he's 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 a you know he's a true believer and he's as brain he is i i think i said made my point he's the number one most gaslit scientologist in the world uh and, you know, there's a tremendous investment in keeping him that way, more so than anybody else in the world. Well, I, I just want your comments on a couple of things. Sure. John Brousseau, who was CEO for 40 years. Right. I know John. English, he's a contractor type guy. He interviewed with Tony Ortega, and mm -hmm. he told Tony that Tom Cruise considers... David Miscavige to be a god. Any comments? I would agree with John 100%. Really? He really views... Absolutely. Absolutely. He Ooh. considers him... He considers him... I, I don't know if god's the right word, but he considers him to be the most important, most powerful person in the world. And I know this because I've seen it. I've I, Listen, I've been experiencing it myself at times when you're thinking... There were times when I I thought, well, David Miscavige is the most powerful person in the world because he has something more powerful than nuclear weapons. Uh, <laughs> he he has the truth, and once you believe that all of this stuff is real and true, and you are part of a group that are the sole possessors of this, you know what I'm talking about, Kara. <laughs> then the guy who's leading and controlling that is the most powerful person in the world. I wouldn't agree that he's a god. I mean, I think in a kind of colloquial sense that's true what john said in a kind of like yeah like saying the you know uh you know eric clapton is a god you know there's different definitions of god right like mm -hmm. a, a god and a playing guitar uh, so i think in a sort of vernacular sense he sees him as a god but not literally a god i think he sees him as the most powerful person in the world hmm. that, that would be my <laughs> take on it <laughs> I'd like to explore this a little further. Do you mind sure. if I just... Oh, no, not can, at all. Can, you know, I was reading some papers where Harvard, a Harvard doctor was... No, I'm not sure if he was Harvard. This is the original doctor that brought out 
placebo education oh. to the medical world. Interesting. And he was he was handling war torn soldiers who were in so much shock. If you lose a leg, your body goes into you could die just of the shock, never mind. Right, injury. right, right. And what they what he was doing is he was giving them, you know, very high doses of uh, not methadone. What is the painkiller they give? Anyway, he was injecting them. Morphine, the, not morphine. Morphine, morphine. Yeah. And he was telling them, the pain will stop. This is a wonder. Da, da, da. And then he ran out of morphine totally. And there were another 20, 30 soldiers waiting in line. And the nurse took saline solution, just salt water, and kept giving him the needles. <laughs> And he didn't know that it wasn't heroin. And he still told these, this is right. it. The pain will turn off. Blah, blah. Right. And even though those last soldiers only got saline water, all the pain turned off. All of them had the exact placebo effect as if they were given actual morphine. So why am I diverting into placebos and morphine? I'm wondering what on earth was gaslit into Tom Cruise's head so suggestively that he refuses to look at anything on the internet, which is hundreds of videos, thousands of stories, people leaving left, right, and center. But Tom has the mental belief that is unshakable. Mm -hmm. Any comment? No, I think that's 100% true. I think anything, because I've experienced this myself, uh, and I've seen it in others, so um, anything that you see, it becomes very filtered. So if you're seeing all this stuff, these are people, we used to have a term for it. We would call it, uh, we would say, like somebody left, the Karen De La Carriera, she's, uh, 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 she went over to the dark side. <laughs> this is how... Did you ever hear that when you were in, Karen, the dark side? Yeah, they, they don't like to say so-and-so join Marty and Mike. And Yeah, they say, oh, they, they went over they, to the... They went over to the dark side. They went oh. over to the dark side. I mean, they might say they joined Marty and Mike, but they'll say that afterwards. They like to say... They don't even like the word... Uh, this is my recent experience at Gold amongst the staff members there, uh, especially the ones in HCO that are the most engaged with, uh, quote-unquote, protecting the members... They don't even like to use the word suppressive. They just call people, they say, oh, they're an attacker. Hmm. You know, if I, if, uh, let's say that I just bumped into somebody and I didn't even know they were at, I'll say I was in and hmm. I bumped into somebody or I said somebody uh, hi on Facebook and I didn't know what their current status was, I could be hauled in and they would just say, oh, they're an attacker. And, hmm. and you know, and, and then I could be accused of just because I said hi to them. Oh, he's an attacker. So they mm. like to put a verb. They like to use verbs. They're not, they don't like, nouns are too soft. The SP, that's a noun. They like a verb. He's an attacker. He does something. Mm. So anyway, I don't know how, I think I got off the track a little bit. But yeah, the point was, as you see things through this filter, it's all just an attack. There's even a policy written by Hubbard. I, I always forget the name of it. I'm sure that you're familiar with it. Uh, something about, <clears throat> doing well and success or whatever that when you see the SPs, you know, outside the door getting noisy, you know, and they're protesting, that means we're as Scientologists, we're being effective. It means we're having an effect on the world. So mm -hmm. you're indoctrinated to believe that the noisier that the public sentiment becomes, the more they're winning, <laughs> the more they're winning. And so this is, part, <laughs> I know, I know that's why it's kind of like, when you ask me, and I know you're so familiar with this, I know when you ask me, so uh, why or how or why or whatever would you believe that? It's like, you know, you almost want to laugh and mm -hmm. say, well, yeah, because they're tricked into thinking, you know, if I if if, if I had a, a photo of David Miscavige strangling a baby, they wouldn't they think, well, that's just Photoshop, even if it really yeah. happened. And yeah. even if he was in jail and in prison yeah. and there were eyewitnesses, they'd say, no, 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 no. This is all a plot. It's SPs. They're just going to bring us down. It's insane. There's no end to it. Well, uh, so my question was, what could Miscavige have done to 
spellbind Tom Cruise's mind so that he has shut off. He won't look at both sides, no matter what, no matter. Well, I think he's upset that his career, that he's being identified as a Scientology symbol. I think that has caused. Well, I, I, my guess is, and this is strictly a guess, that Tom is very aware of what happened. You know, he went through this period. We all know about it, where he, he had a publicist. I forget her name. Tony yes. wrote about it. She said, Tom, you got to knock this yeah. Scientology yeah. crap off because yeah. it's not good for your career. He fired her and yeah. hired, hired his his very nice but incredibly unqualified sister, Leanne, yeah. to be his publicist. And then it was just game on. I, you know, I, he's jumping on couches and he's like, <laughs> he's going on, he's going, you know, he's talking to Matt Lauer and he's doing this, this thing, which is a complete miscavige tactic is to use your first name. Now, Matt, Matt, now, Matt. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He did that? Okay, yeah. he, he learned that from David Miscavige. Because I've seen Miscavige do this. People, he will use their first name as a way of being the alpha male. Yeah. An alpha male thing. It's like, we can't beat our chest, so we do things like we use the guy's first name. I guarantee you, when David Miscavige went into the IRS to verbally assault Fred Goldberg, who was the commissioner, and tell him the 2000, you know, the lawsuits and all that stuff, we'll call it off if you give us tax exemption. I guarantee you, Karen, he went in there when he got that meeting and he sat down and he said, now, Fred, Fred, now listen, Fred. And he talked to him the same way that Ms., that, that Tom- He became David Miscavige. Did you see that 100%. little clip with Peter Overton? Get your manners in. Manners in. Get oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure that Ms. Gavish said that to Fred Goldberg. Now, Fred, mm -hmm. Fred, you, you, the IRS needs to get his manners in. I'm sure <laughs> it's the way that he talked to people. It, it, it's just like, I, yeah, it, it is one of the many like little things he did because he's very much an alpha male. He's very much, you know, has to be the smartest guy in the room and da da da. da. And, and then, but yeah, anyway, this also, he getting back to the caste system. Um, he maintains this very segmented uh, culture, right? Like I was for years on the good side of it. Like we'd have a meeting, positive meeting. This is I'm I'm referring to a very specific thing. We're at ASI. You know, remember the you've been in ASI. Remember the the, the conference room in there, the big conference yeah, yeah. table. Mm -hmm. It had it had a finish. Remember the finish? It was like it was like. 10 Steinway pianos. It was so mm. perfect, this finish. Like mm. you were you were afraid to breathe on it. Mm. <laughs> You'd be like mm. uh, severely, it was uh, the blonde wood, this beautiful, anyway, whatever. We're mm. in there having me and another guy and we're having this very positive meeting about some project back and forth. Da, 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 da. Then mm. uh, Lou, his girlfriend assistant, pops her head in and she gives him this look like they're ready. And he said, hey, can you guys just come on my side of the table? So we're like, yeah, whatever. So now we come over and sit next to him, me and this other guy I was working with. We sit next to him, and all of the top execs from OSA come walking in, right? Corinne Powell, Linda Hamill, you know, all these guys. They're all Sea Org members, and he has them sit down. I have no idea what's going to happen or why I'm even in this meeting. It has nothing to do with me. And he rips into these guys like with a level of verbal abuse that I've mm -hmm. never seen, although I saw it many times from him. And then mm -hmm. I realized we're on his side of the table because me and this other guy, we're not in the Sea Org. And this mm -hmm. is serving to amplify the humiliation that they're mm -hmm. being called out in front of these two pros because he mm -hmm. loved to do this thing, which was, mm -hmm. I had to hire these guys or this guy because you effers weren't doing mm -hmm. your jobs. And so people would ask me, well, how come they never recruited for the Sea Org? I'm like, they needed me to be able to say, mm -hmm. I wasn't in the, he needed me to be, say, I wasn't in the Sea Org so he could make other people feel guilty for him having to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that was towards the end where I really had that realization. But um, that's part of this caste system where he keeps people really segmented. Uh, it, anyway. It's cannibal. It, the other labels are robot. You're robotism. You're a robot. You're a degraded being. You're oh, his, RSA, his, RSA, oh, yeah. rock slam. Well, there's one that starts yeah. with C and has the end of it has sucker. Mm. Okay. Ooh. That's one of his famous favorites. Ooh. 
Ooh. That's that's a real favorite word of his. I don't know why. Uh, and then and then the other one is a pie face, and that might have yeah. come in a little bit as you were leaving, because mm -hmm. that's what I found out about it was pie face. Mm -hmm. That was literally people who would um, mm -hmm. yeah. do it here. I don't think I have a big enough piece of paper, but yeah, I've I've drawn this. You know, I should just keep a drawing of this next to my computer at all times, but. It was um, anyway. Can you see this? I might be too small. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Mike Rinder. Mike Rinder yeah. did a whole post. Did he? He, he, yeah. he had to. He had to wear one over his. Yeah, 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 yeah. And here, yeah. here's something I found out that blew my mind. I had a meeting with him one night while all those guys were in the hole and I didn't know they were all in the hole. Mike, mm. that whole bunch that were when they were mm. still in there. Mm. And he and Lou came down to the what's called the IMPR conference room, which was the mm. conference room at Gold where he would come meet us. Me and this one other person who was a writer, neither of us, our CERG members, we were both hired to work for him for Gold. And they came walking in <laughs> like that. <laughs> laughing and jovial and slapping each other on the back. And they're both wearing these like, you know, $4,000 Italian tailored leather jackets and, yeah. you know, their black jeans and boots. And like, they got nothing to do with, with you. You would know that these people were CERC members, you know, if somebody hit you over head with their billion year contracts and they're just chuckling up and they sit down and they start telling us this whole story about, pie face and about, oh, I just got out of a meeting with a bunch of executives. And, you know, you ask these guys a question and all they do is they go pie face here. Here's what it looks like. Hey, Lou, show them what it looks like. And she draws this thing. And took it. <laughs> then years mm -hmm. later, I found out that the thing that they're laughing about is they just came from the hole, which was 150 feet from where we were meeting. They had just been in there torturing these guys, like at a level of human rights abuse that could mm -hmm. land them in prison. And then they're walking in and laughing mm -hmm. about it to mm -hmm. me and me and my partner, or my writing partner, were kind of like, mm -hmm. we're thinking, yeah, this spy face thing is actually kind of funny because I've seen people in meetings that like, they're just mm -hmm. like that because they don't want to answer, mm -hmm. you know, because they're afraid if they say the, whatever answer they say is the wrong mm -hmm. thing. And mm -hmm. so then they get called out for that. So It's just... <laughs> There's always humiliation in the yeah. ingredient. It isn't yeah. just dominating you. It's you don't just you're not That's just horrible. sentenced to go clean the dumpster. You have to clean the dumpster only with a toothbrush. Yeah. Imagine everything yeah. has a hook of humiliation there. What a this is a religion? This is a yeah. church? Yeah. Where is the humanity? Yeah. Where's the kindness? Well, I, I think when Hubbard was around, they did a lot of, uh, you know, putting on a good show of humanity. And, and people got helped, although the outcomes eventually were very bad. But Miscavige, did, he dispensed with all of that stuff. You know, the, all of the good that they do is it's because Rachel Hastings went and made a video, a fake video, and brought it back. She didn't even know it was fake, brought it back and showed it. And, and a gas lit all Scientologists to think they were involved in something good. You know, you, you, it's a long time since you can find people since that were actually helped by Scientology. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask you one final question about Tom Cruise. Okay. We looked at the hierarchy and how celebs are pampered. What in base installation? What did the slaves at in base? Oh no no no! I'm going to interrupt my own. Okay self. okay. I'm going to interrupt. Okay, go ahead. No no no! I'm waiting for your question. Can you? Apparently, Tom is treated like a Saudi king. There is absolutely nothing <laughs> in the hierarchy. People were told you are not to look in his eyes. If you walk, if he's walking on the base, I believe a person who said something of hi, something he was sent to the RPF for talking to Tom Cruise on 
unwarranted. In, in other words, Tom didn't open the conversation and he said hello or something. This is the heart. That was a Sea Org member, and Tom is a non Sea Org member celebrity. Right. right. What special pampering do you know happened with the Sea Org slaves? Were you there when they had to dig all night to make mm -hmm. uh, the flowers? So Tom. Tom gave a wishful comment like, ooh, I'd love to walk through holding Nicole's hand in a meadow of daisies, whatever. Right. So so what did what did he order? What did Miscavige order Sea Oak to do? Well, there's a kind of a open uh, at the south end of the property where the G's was, the village where we were living. And when Tom first came up, I was already living there. Danny was living there. Tom moved in. I guess he was there for about a year. He was kind of back and forth. And then they built the the L. Ron Hubbard house, which is known as BV, or uh, BV is beautiful Val. I forget what it is. It's some Spanish word that means beautiful view. Bonnie view. How could I forget that? Uh, they spent whatever, million, $10 million. Millions. You know, millions. Yeah, millions of dollars building this, this museum slash house to Hubbard. Uh, and then for Hubbard's uh, return, they yeah, believe, yeah, yeah he, exactly, he, yeah, he would come and, back, yeah. And it was crazy because, like, I'd been in that house many times, I'd shot in that house, I'd poked around it because I had unfettered access to most everything up there. And I, I, I remember I went in and opened the closet in the bedroom, and it was like there's all these clothes in there that you, mm -hmm. you recognize from photos all the way back to like St. Hill like mm -hmm. jackets and there was hats and there was shoes and there was shirts and you'd seen a lot of the stuff and they were, they were maintaining the stuff like hand washing it weekly, you know, washing it, rinsing it five times to make sure there were so, no suds, you know, it, um, it kind of reminded me of, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with the cargo cult in, I think it's New Guinea. Do you know this mm -hmm. group? Have you ever heard of them? No. Well, they are a very primitive tribe who, uh, from I believe it's New Guinea, mm -hmm. and y there's an article on Wikipedia, you can read about it. It's either called the Cargo Cult or the Cult of the Cargo. During World War II, uh, um, the Americans landed on this island. They'd never seen white people. They'd never seen airplanes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they brought all these things with them, food and fuel and and you know, Coca-Cola machines and ice and all this kind of stuff. And when they left, the people on the island, they incorporated all of the stuff that they'd brought with them. And they thought that if they started to go through these rituals, that these gods, these white gods who brought you know Coca-Cola and stuff like that would return. To this day, there are members of that tribe who have been Harvard trained or Oxford, Cambridge trained mm. and still believe in this religion that, mm. that performs these rituals. And so I, it, it reminded me when I saw these Seorik members laying out his clothes and washing the clothes and making the beds. It remind, because the cargo cult, what they did was they incorporated these new rituals into their religion mm. because they thought it would bring the thing back. Mm. And so I, I thought these people, it's like the cargo cult. They think if they lay Hubbard's clothes out and they wash his clothes, that somehow, you know, and they put out glasses of fresh water with little doilies on top of them so no radioactive dust gets in the water, that somehow they'll help to attract this being to come back. It's pretty nuts. It's really nuts, especially when you have Sea Org members that uh, are denied medical care because the, org, the organization can't afford it. Hmm. Yeah, and things like when you start looking at all this stuff, you're like, "This thing's crazy. It's it's really nuts." So, but my, my I point, to... yeah, I just want to say one thing about Cruz. When they built that Bonnie View house, it, it was part of a complex. They built some VIP quarters, some really lovely, much nicer than what he was living in, where I was still living. And then once that was completed, that's where he and his family would always stay when they came up. And the rest of us would hardly see them anymore. Mm. Didn't they build it? Didn't wasn't there a shooting range or yeah, just, something for just, Tom to play? Yeah, just up the hill above that, um, there was a shooting range. It had a like a hand skeet machine. Mm. You know, you pull a rope and it 
shoots a clay pigeon up in the air. It was pretty funky. And I know that uh, they went through, uh, Dave was up there shooting with Tom one day and then all of a sudden, miraculously, by the time he came back, I think what happened was, I believe what happened was Tom purchased a very expensive skeet machine that mm. where it was like an automatic one. You just hit a button and it would, it would throw mm. the, the clay pigeons up into the air. You wouldn't have to have somebody pulling the thing. And when that arrived, then Dave went and incorporated it into it. He had a whole, a whole rebuild done on the shooting range. Uh, so that, yeah, it was definitely a gentleman's club of two people. So, And a luxury gymnasium gym for workouts. And yeah, workouts. yeah, really nice gym because yeah. both Dave and his dad, Ron, were mm -hmm. really obsessed with exercise equipment and physical fitness. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think his father might have been involved a little bit in what equipment to acquire. You see, if you calculate here, OK, here's a question. Mm -hmm. I, I want I want to ask you. Is Scientology making more enemies than recruiting newbies? <laughs> because oh. their stat of people coming out day after day with horror stories, that stat is straight up and vertical. A newcomer, right. a newcomer, new people joining, joining, joining right. the fray of, of whistleblowing. Well, do you think? Yeah, go no, ahead. No, no, you, you uh, finish your question. Well, the question is, do they make, you, you know how they clobber people inside, punish, humiliate. Yeah, yeah. And they did an analysis of people who fled. People who do the RPF are gone within three years, 90%. The RPF is supposed to be a redemption program to reprogram and recalibrate your mind so that right. you think more like the cult. Right, and you right, realize right. you were all screwed up to be critical of right, right. But in actual fact, people, I did the RPF. My Grinda did the, uh, I mean, just right. tons of people who did the RPF now right. speak out. So right. the RPF is a complete and utter failure. But I'm talking about making enemies. I'm talking about enemies. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> make, they make enemies faster. Is it, do you think they're making enemies faster than, than they're recruiting? I'm talking about loyal, diehard Scientology Sea Org members. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, yes, I do. I do. I think obviously you have some of their best spokespeople, myself included. I'm going to put myself in that category. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I designed the, the Elleridge Life Exhibition. I was the chief architect of all of the media and the displays in the industry of death museum and i was the the mm -hmm. you know the lead art director creator of the what are known as the public information displays like all of these you know i i i uh did the the, the reinvention of the narconon program uh with mm -hmm. films and new narconons and all kinds of crazy eye candy bullshit so I don't know how many more people like that they can afford to leave, uh, to lose. I mean, they do have some people that are smart people that are carrying on, but they're not they are not necessarily the innovative kind of people that are going to be. They've learned to do what we did that was successful. But the thing they don't know is how to change and evolve as the landscape changes and the landscape will change it. And since COVID, I mean, uh, that's when I really disengaged from Scientology, when lockdown happened. It gave, once uh, Two things happened simultaneously. Once I was starting to suffer my own level of abuse, mm -hmm. uh, which was very mm -hmm. different than being thrown in the hole or other kinds mm -hmm. of things like that. Uh, but it, uh, uh, And then I was still reaching out to them for help because I had not yet realized, and this is just a personal thing it's not what you asked but this is my own personal aspect i had not come to realize that you the chances that you will reach out to your abuser for help are very great mm -hmm. the, the national uh, the national abuse hotline which is not just a phone number it's an organization and though it mostly deals with domestic abuse the the statistics uh, that it finds that it discovers 
are just as relevant to cults, and they know that. And it takes a person an average of seven attempts to leave uh, a uh, an abusive relationship, right? Mm. So mm. you will tend to reach back to the people that abused you for help. Yeah. So I went through a few of those cycles where I was having extreme mental issues and I was, you know, thinking about the ultimate worst thing you could do to yourself, which we can't say on YouTube, and reached out to them for help. Mm -hmm. And it really took a lot of work to realize that the people that I was reaching out to were the people that had abused me, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I bring this up because I'm going to, it, it informs your question, um, mm -hmm. is, is about people leaving and so forth. Scientology has an incredible facility, and this was designed by L. Ron Hubbard, to instill in you, to first of all, attract you by virtue of your vulnerability mm -hmm. and your idealism. Mm -hmm. Everybody at one time or another is vulnerable, and most people are ideal in some way or another. And mm -hmm. th they know how to capture this. And it's it's a very complicated system. It has to do with having you take tests, having you be on the e-meter and, uh, and being asked questions. And you really begin to believe that somebody knows enough about you to really help you. And then ultimately you become abused. And then that's when the thing starts to crack. It doesn't crack when Karen mm -hmm. and I go on YouTube or Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Aaron Smith Levin or anybody else, and they tell their stories. That's not what does it. In my view, that keeps new people from joining, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get existing members out at all because they just mm -hmm. think we're crazy. Mm -hmm. What gets them out is they hit a tipping point where yes. they have had enough abuse that mm -hmm. they start to say, wait a minute, I'm in pain. This doesn't mm -hmm. feel right. I can't mm -hmm. talk to my friends. I'm broke. I should, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, I can list the actors that I know mm -hmm. who should have had much better careers than they have, but they focus so much on Scientology because they thought that was what they should be doing, that their careers, basically, they had nothing, little careers. You mm -hmm. know, they did, they did some, I mean, some, I, I, at some point, I'll just, I'm going to talk to those people directly, but it's a fact. So I think when COVID hit uh, and it shut down the orcs, and a lot of people left. Mm. I don't. I don't think that the two things I think ultimately mm. led to the acceleration mm. of the downfall of Scientology mm. was the COVID pandemic, the lockdown, and the internet. Mm. Those those two things, they were a one-two. And then you have, as you say, they're their worst enemies. They're they're protecting. Uh, they're, they're helping to shield criminality, yeah. especially with yeah. children and women. And you add that all together, and no, nobody is joining Scientology. People are leaving in droves. And the, mo the more they were abused, the, the louder they're falling. You're right, right. People have a threshold. Enough is enough. I, I hit that threshold before I walked. Now, I want to ask you this. You've talked about the painful... Uh, abuse you had Very, much of it was emotional spiritual psychological because you weren't in the hole and, but i want to ask you who who does it roll back to who was the who <laughs> well it, it it rolls back to uh hubbard because it's his policies i mean if you're doing a rollback and and just so our our viewers understand a rollback is it's a it's a, a, a hubbard uh piece of technology where you 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 somebody saying something like somebody saying well you know karen de la carrier she's this she's something and then you start you pull that person in you say where did you hear that and then you write and then you pull that person in and you say where did you hear that where did you hear that and they try to roll it back to the the originator and then the that's source. <laughs> right the source yeah that's the person they punish so ultimately it's it's the where did you hear that it goes back to hubbard Okay, I hear you, Mitch, but Hubbard's been dead and gone. Okay, so you want a live warm body? Who I'll give you a couple. Manifesting the abuse physically, not, you know, Hubbard's long gone. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a number of people. That, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I, I knew as I was saying that, you know, you can't arrest a dead person. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we need a warm body here. Well, uh, 
Miscavige has a great way of shielding himself from this because he uses proxies. Yes. Like he uses other people and then he gets other people to act for him. Um, you know, I've said a number of times that, that uh, you know, mean dog owners, their dogs are usually mean, right? Because they, they <laughs> right? They say, and so he's, he's like on a literal level, yeah. Miscavige, he and his wife Shelley is former. Uh, they're still married, but whatever. They had like I think five beagles. And these were just the nastiest dogs I've ever met. They were the meanest dogs, and it always cracked me up because you know he used to say that if his dog, one of one of his his dogs like literally ripped a pair of two hundred dollar jeans off of me, um, just because I wanted to take a walk in the rose garden and I didn't realize his dogs were out there, but. Um, he said his dogs could sniff out ethics. Yeah, he did. And he actually, if his dogs didn't like you or barked at you, then you were an SB. You could get in trouble. Because so, his dog didn't like you. And yeah. And so <laughs> so he he had humans that were acting like that as well. Hmm. So because he was a mean dog owner, he had mean dogs. He was a mean hmm. manager and leader. So he had mean underlings. And so there was a number of people. I mean, the worst I ever got it, was always from somebody in HCO, which is the ethics mm -hmm. people. When mm -hmm. I was at SMP, <clears throat> they brought in a special mm -hmm. new new level of, of HCO people. I mean, these people were trained at Flag. They were next level in terms of being abusive. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Unbelievable, unbelievable mm -hmm. stuff, you know, because, and I think, you know, as Rachel has explained, mm -hmm. we were talking about this, Rachel Hastings, she and I worked together there. Mm -hmm. This HCO group, one of the things to understand is that their job is, their statistic is situations, and that's something bad. A situation mm -hmm. means a bad thing. When you mm -hmm. say in Scientology, I uncovered a situation, that means you have found something bad. Their statistic is situations detected and handled. Mm -hmm. So that means if everything is going great, they have no statistic. And they mm -hmm. need to start finding people and chopping them up mm -hmm. and accusing them of things so that they'll have a statistic so that they don't get punished. And these people at, at SMP, they, they practiced that to a T, even mm -hmm. to the point where they were threatening professionals who'd been hired there who were never in Scientology. They were threatening them with sec checks to mm -hmm. actually sec check people that they hired that were paying a lot of money to to come in and do work for them because mm -hmm. the, uh, these guys are crazy. I mean, these are kind of the, you know, the, these are going to be the, the most difficult people to sort of bring out of that, <laughs> that dark nightmare that they're stuck in. I mean, these are the ones that, you know, like, Whoa, you know, a lot of people, you just turn the switch off on the reality distortion machine and they'll start looking around and going, Oh, wow. Yeah, I was like, I was, uh, these guys, they're just going to go crazy because they're, 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 you know, they're, a lot of them were raised from birth to be that way. You know, they were, they were told their parents aren't their parents. They were told, you know, they're, they're, they're going to live for a trillion years or they're, if they don't join the Sea Org, they're going to be a rock. You know, they've never been seen as children. They've never, been, nobody ever told them, I love you because you're here. I love you because you're you. And they're really dark, damaged people, and they brought a whole crew of them into into S and P. And I mean, that's that's what drove me mm -hmm. out of Scientology. Then I ended up back at Gold, and there was a, a person who was my uh, Amber uh, Sullivan uh, Meller, or whatever her name. She's married to a guy that I trained to be a director, and then she took over the bully. She was once mm -hmm. I fell out of Miscavige's protection which mm -hmm. was kind of a very strange, random thing, how it happened. But once that happened, I was fair game, literally. There's a, it's a different kind of fair game than SB fair mm -hmm. game. But, you know, I had, a, I had a little, you know, 90 pound Sea Org, you know, mm -hmm. person coming in my office every day, throwing like her, like, you know, throwing the weight of her position around. Like it was a, she was a sumo wrestler and just, you know, with hands on hips and, and, you know, yelling at me and I'm going to lock you up in the, in the kitchen and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm like, I can't even sleep, get enough sleep to get in my car and drive away. I'm like completely captive. So yeah, there was some, I wasn't necessarily thrown in the hole, but it was like, mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to get out of there, even if it meant, you know, as we say, leaving our body. So 
this leads me to the next question. Don't mm -hmm. want to put you on the spot, but what are your comments on the nature? I don't like to put everyone in a blob because there's always the good, the bad, and the ugly, but the general nature of int and gold CEO members that how would you word that even though others may disagree what is the nature of the sea org member are these radical fanatics are these duped victims what is the character and nature of sea org at that high hierarchy level? well i mean okay so first of all let me just say that gold is there's no more higher up at gold that doesn't exist yeah. so yeah. in order to answer that question i would have to go back Gold is right is at the present time. It's a backwater production facility. Mm. It, it, it's no longer the glory days of the international base and the home of David Miscavige and all of those those, those very powerful leaders from, you know, you know who they all are. Um, it, it, it doesn't that doesn't exist anymore. It's a it's a basically a backwater production facility. It performs an important uh, service in terms of making uh, content, uh, TV. The commercials you see on the Super Bowl are made at Gold. A lot of the high end filmed content that you see on the Scientology Network is done at Gold, and and so they have this sort of world class production facility, and they're like. They're like the cheesemakers up in the Alps in 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 in, in, in Switzerland. They make mm. this very fine cheese that you can only get in that one place. Mm. But they don't really have a bigger role in the world. Um, all of the international, the the, uh, the management, uh, international management is is completely just des decimated, destroyed. Mm. Uh, it no longer exists. You know, mm. Shelley Miscavige was exiled forever because Dave never wanted to see her again. Contrary to what some people have said. That they she wasn't put in the hole because they thought people in the hole would would follow her, which is not true. The, the hole was a timeout. The hole, I'm sorry, I'm diverting, but the hole was Miscavige's sadistic timeout for people mm -hmm. he didn't want to see. You go take a timeout, and while you're in the hole, just torture one another. You, mm -hmm. Shelly, I never want to see you again. You're going over mm -hmm. to CST. That's kind of how, in my opinion, that's how that whole thing played out because I thought she was a very sweet lady but i from what i saw she was never more than a glorified social director and dave's assistant you know that she was never going to leave the sea or that's for sure uh so just to put that to rest so so but what uh, the 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 really the people how did you describe them the zealots the all of those people are gone they, they're not at gold the people that are left at gold actually some of the more decent people they're the guys on the film crew that mm. made all you know what i'm saying they're artists they want to create um there's no chance they're going to leave because mm. their families are all in so mm. they'd have to give that up they really have you know like they have no structure outside the sea Org, although some of them are so mm. talented that they could leave and get jobs in hollywood mm. like no problem they, they could easily do that. Some of them are very talented, but they're not going to leave. And they're just, you know, the, the the people that you're talking about, like, let's say, Hansuli Stali, right? Remember Hansuli? Oh, he I was, know Hansuli really well. And per, Heidi. Yeah, we, particularly we, now, now. Yes, right. Of course. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. We we did some years together at the flight land base before they went up lines. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you know that Hans Uli is a particularly virulent uh, attack dog yes. that Miscavige would send after uh, mm -hmm. wayward Scientologists. I mean, this guy, his claws and his, have been removed, his fangs have been pulled out, and he works as a dolly grip on the shoot crew. And he's not even a good dolly grip. He pushes a dolly. Somebody, mm -hmm. the guy I train, yells action, and this mm -hmm. guy pushes a dolly. And mm -hmm. Mike Sutter, who was another one of those guys, mm -hmm. he's an assistant, second assistant cameraman or something. And mm -hmm. the rest of them have been given ridiculous menial jobs. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Miscavige is, 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 has moved his empire to L.A. And mm -hmm. he set up this oligarchy uh, mm -hmm. with oligarch. the other. Good word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he's an oligarch. He runs it like an oligarchy. He's got, he's got Scientology Media Productions, which is the seat of power. Mm -hmm. uh, between that and ASI, because he also works out of author services, mm -hmm. where he has this group of incredibly loyal people that mm -hmm. will do anything he needs. He, 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 he needs done, they'll do it. So he's got Scientology Media, but they're not a production facility. 
Scientology Media Productions, and there's Brid Publications that does all of the, the nonfiction works of L. Ron Hubbard, all the Scientology Dianetics works. Then you have the Dissemination Center, which pumps out the endless amount of, uh, of mail that we all get, or hopefully we're not getting any more, or, hey, you need ball caps or, or volunteer ministers' jackets or whatever, or special signage for the orgs. It's like this massive mm -hmm. uh, production facility. And then you have a place called Compilations, where they have everything Hubbard ever wrote laid out in tables on an entire huge, biggest warehouse you've ever seen. It's like that end scene in Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And um, they're trying to figure out <laughs> what order it all goes in. There were in. a lot of confidential, really. The, the Guardian yeah. orders, would, yeah. would those also be... Well, they would be no. They're they're the treated Osa separately. Huh? They're they're treated separately. We're talking. I'm talking about. Yeah, Just this is the bridge from okay. the bottom up through class mm -hmm. eight. This mm -hmm. would also include, you know, the Saint Hill Special Briefing Course. It would include everything laid out with mm -hmm. the lectures in date order, so that they can try to make sense out of it because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. So, but anyway, my point is these, this, these, each one of these are like when. Putin handed out, okay, your oil, your manure, your uh, whatever the farming, wheat, whatever the different industries were that he handed out. So he's handed these things out to these oligarchs who, uh, and then he runs the whole thing like an oligarchy. Mm -hmm. And that's basically replaced the whole management structure of Scientology, mm -hmm. except that those oligarchs, they're very flexible. Like, it's like, okay, you, you're going to, you're going to a special program. You need to get handled. You take over here. You come here. I need help with this. They're all kept in constant flux. I heard somebody who recently left referred to those people as his homies. They are not his homies. He has one homie, and that's Dave, that's uh, Tom Cruise. And there, uh, there's no and Lou. Other than that, he's got no friends mm -hmm. whatsoever. Nobody, nobody. Everybody fears him. Nobody likes him. Hmm. Uh, so I think that I answer your question about people. It was the nature of CO. Oh, still yeah. So the, the, forget about gold because those people are like, Miscavige hasn't been up there since 2013. Hmm. They're breathing a sigh of relief. I mean, they're hmm. not out of the woods. They just sent Heber off to an old age home. Yes. You know, they, they, uh, you know, I'm not sure where Danny Sherman was when he passed away, probably in the hospital when COVID hit. Danny had to go move back up to gold because he'd lost a lung because he's a heavy smoker and he has rheumatoid arthritis and he refused to quit smoking. So mm. he, he lost anyway, because he had no lung. You're not going to survive COVID with one lung. Mm. So they sent him up to gold and I'm not sure what happened, but with, but you know, so the people up there, I mean, there's a couple of people in HCO that are kind of nasty, you know, that are still doing their investigative thing you know, that like take the time to write software so they can track their lousy 250 staff members. Like, I don't know why you need software who never leave. So <laughs> there's not really, people at, at Gold are 100%, they're 100% just, you know, hypnotized. They're not the, they're not the, the nasty perpetrators. Those are all in LA, okay? Mm -hmm. They work at, at HCO, at Scientology Media Productions, or they're the special group of like Miscavige's RTC fellows who run these production facilities. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably a big case. I mean, gold is probably like a paradise now compared to what it was mm -hmm. when Miscavige was up there. The violence, the beatings. Can I, can I throw in a little Shelley Miscavige anecdote? Absolutely. We're talking about, how happy they are and relaxed they are at gold not to have a violent puncher and <laughs> not to have David Miscavige parading around. So this is just a little story of Mark Fisher, good and close friend of mine, who was up on a ladder and David Miscavige was screaming at him for some incompetence on the job, whatever. And when Mark came down, David Miscavige punched him violently in the nose and blood came streaming down. And David Miscavige always walked around with an entourage mm -hmm. like he was royalty. Mm -hmm. And he had Lou, of course, but he also had Shelley. Right. And they had little um, 
what do you call these little packs? Fanny packs. They had right. a fanny pack. And immediately Shelly opened her fanny pack and took out some cotton swabs and hydrogen peroxide and she dabbed uh, and she soothed and she gave some nice kind words to Mark Fisher. But when I heard the story, I thought, they walk around with the first aid kit knowing yeah. that Miscavige is going to punch and there's yeah. going to be blood and they need antiseptic antibiotics. <laughs> they know <laughs> that. Right. And they are prepared in their fanny pack to give first aid to the next person that Miscavige is going to break their nose or bloody their nose or whatever. When I said, what is the mindset? The mindset is we've got to support violence and so on, no matter what. Comment? Right. right. Well, first, I just have a minor aside. Uh, so what else was in that fanny pack was uh, a big lighter, an unopened pack of camels, and an ashtray. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> because, you know, wherever Miss Gavish went for a meeting, there would be chewing gum to cover up his alcohol problem. And, you know, like breath mints, uh, cigarettes, a lighter. And then he'd come in. He'd have maybe one or two smokes and he'd leave. Like, And then he'd never see that pack of cigarettes again. So it just always cracked me up. Uh, so comment. It's These guys don't think they're violent, okay? It's not violence. It's what needs to happen so that we can get the mission done. That's very different than a mafia guy that's like, you go fuck him up. Okay, mm -hmm. you put a bullet in his brain. You do that. They know that that's violence, and they don't care because they're that's just mm -hmm. the nature. It's like this is the life I've chosen, right? Uh, but these guys, they don't know. It's just the mission. Like you know, Dave, he's the hardest working guy in the world. I mean, and to some degree, like here's the deal: there are times when that guy worked me under the table, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so he would do enough of that, like where we I'd have to stay up all night and he'd just be right there across from me at the desk. And we'd have to work on some script or something. And I was like, Jesus, fuck, I just want to go home. I'm dying. And he's just like he's manic. Right. And he just work, 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 work. So he did that enough so he could really make everybody around him feel really guilty. Right. Uh, in the final analysis. 90% of the work was being done by other people, if not more. But he would do enough work to be able to create, keep this myth going and this fiction going. So if he punched you in the face or if he puts you on beans and rice for two months, uh, I might add beans and rice that were being cooked in a kitchen that was at the uh, 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 that was made, instructed by him to be built at the highest level of industrial food, you know, support, uh, mm -hmm. so that you know after he punched you in the face, he could say, yeah, but also look what I did for you. But if he does that, if he punches you in the face or puts you in rice and beans for a month or sticks you in the hole, mm -hmm. it's because you deserved it, man. Because you got in the way of the mission. You got in the way of us literally saving the consciousness of every man, woman, and child on this planet for eternity. So the least I can do is punch you in the face because mm -hmm. the violence that you perpetrated by mm -hmm. interfering with the mission is far greater than anything you're accusing me of. That's the mindset. Mm -hmm. Well answered. Thank you, Rich. Well, you're very <laughs> welcome. Okay. Now, 30 years, what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell me what lesson, major lesson learned, what was your takeaway after this extraordinary, God, I don't 40 years of this, 40 years. Oh well, God. I was in Scientology for 20 years before that. Oh, so you were recruited as a Scientologist. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I um, was, I was. You know, when I got into Scientology, I was a 23-year-old drug-addicted, heroin-addicted film school dropout. Mm. You know, and I was, you know, whatever. Mm. That's a whole long story. I've told it many times. But, yeah, I had, I had, I was OT5 when I, you know, OT5 when I went to gold. So, mm. you know, uh, so what is my advice to people? Don't do heroin <laughs> because of that. Don't do drugs because that, you know, the, the anyway. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for that. lessons learned for some 
for staying in the cult for 30 years, not your pre-Scientology life of heroin. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, I understand. Well, that's a really, that's a complicated question. I mean, um, lessons. I mean, I, I don't know that I, lessons, you're like life lessons. No, I, no, no, not that definition. Just wisdom gained. Uh, well, what you know, you endured. Mm -hmm. well, I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. I'm still, uh, we, we actually, life is full of so many mysteries. Mm -hmm. Like life itself is a mystery. And there are people that will take advantage of what you don't know, which is what everybody doesn't know. On Scientology's main landing page, it very clearly says Scientology has answers mm -hmm. to life's biggest questions who mm. am i where am i going you know what what i don't really know them by heart but i what i set up to there is a complete quote and so you have to be more suspicious about anybody who's going to offer any kind of answer to any of those questions because the most wonderful thing about life is that it is mysterious the mystery of life is to be embraced and by embracing it, you can actually discover your identity. You can discover what you want to be in that mystery. And you're not going to, because once you start letting that ideology or that person provide the answers for you, mm -hmm. you're lost. Mm -hmm. You're done. You're no, you're no longer going to see your position in, mm -hmm. in the great scheme of things. You know, mm -hmm. it's why I, I mean, I spoke about this on my channel. It's why I adopted Iris Dement's. Uh, song uh, "Let the Mystery Be" as my my anthem. I actually, she very graciously granted me a license to quote from that song in my book. And it's you know, there's a line about everybody's wondering what's going to happen when the whole thing's done. Everybody's a worrying where they're going to go, you know. And basically, the message of the song is, "It's all the same to me. I'm just going to let the mystery be." And this is the one thing that Scientology cannot do. They hmm. cannot let that mystery be. They they will constantly concern themselves with solving that mystery for you and telling you that if you don't solve it, you are doomed. Hmm. And this is like run, run, run when you hear this stuff. It's like you don't need the answer to life. You don't. You need to just love the people that are near you. And you need to try to find out what is authentically you. That's all. Uh, that's probably the big, biggest lesson I learn uh, mm -hmm. by being up there. And I also learned that the best people can do the worst things to their fellows. Mm -hmm. You startled me when you talked to me about how <clears throat> how Hanzuli evolved. I knew him as this kind, gentle German. My God, this is a complete personality. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, that Scientology made him because he was yeah. a sweetheart. He was. It happens to a lot of people. It, I used to call him Hansuli Stasi after the German secret police. And, uh, anyway, he was a horrible yeah. person. And, um, you know, now that he's just working on the shoot crew, pushing a dolly, you know, he's a real nice guy. He's a little bit of a bumbling idiot. He's like, he's managed to be in America for what, 50 years and you still can't understand his accent. And to me, that's a, a lack of observation because I've known people who came over here for five years and you, they have an accent, but you can understand them perfectly well. Uh, but yeah, he was, uh, he was a henchman. He was he was engaged. Unbelievable. In, Unbelievable. Yeah, he was engaged in a lot of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 Can yeah, I it, ask you what happened to John Eastman and Peggy? Okay. Well, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not. I think Peggy is still working somehow in tech. Was she also a class twelve? No, no, no. No, she. But she, was, she was. Oh, okay, fine. Peggy still has a sort of you know, regular job. But John, when I went up to, uh, when I went up to gold, John was senior CS Ant. Yeah. Which was and then very, busted. Sorry? And then busted. Busted off tech clients. Yeah, he he was the C senior CS Ant when I first went there. And uh, I was actually called into his office after I was there for about three weeks. And I knew Ray Midoff, who was the former senior CS. You know Ray very well. He was one of your, your students. Um, no. Fellow class 12. No, I thought he, he was not. Gre no, that was Greg Wilhelm. 
Oh, right, Greg. But you, but, but but you knew Ray really well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Ray was the inspector general tech when I went up there, yeah. and John Eastman was senior CSN. Okay, so we had shot a film, like the second film that I worked on, and uh, there was a meter read that went like this, but it was supposed to go like this, or there's a little thing in the middle of the read. <laughs> so, so the way that it works is if we make a mistake like that, the senior CSN or a technical person, later exclusively David Miscavige, they'd look at it and they'd write a little note and they'd say, hey guys, you need to fix this little thing. We'd fix it, it cost 10 cents, mm -hmm. and then they'd finish the film and export it, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Their job was to find the errors and correct them. So we get called up. So me and the script supervisor and the cameraman get called up to senior CSN's office. And so Hansuli is standing next to John. Mm -hmm. And then Hansuli has me stand on the other side of John. And then they're addressing these two crew members. But I'm not in the line of fire. They've positioned me off the line of fire. You get it? Mm. And I'm thinking, oh, they want me to watch this, right? Mm -hmm. And they rip into these two staff members like, you guys have no idea what you almost did. You shot an erroneous e-meter read. And if that had been exported, it could have destroyed Scientology worldwide. Mm -hmm. And they really, I'm, I'm, I just don't have the energy mm -hmm. right now to yell and scream. Mm -hmm. But they, they were really mm -hmm. letting these guys, these guys were, they were shuddering in their boots. They had no idea if they were going to be sent to the RPF. Now, you have to understand that it was it was John Eastman's job mm -hmm. to detect this thing and, and let us know to fix it. Mm -hmm. So he was basically screaming at them because he did his job. I don't I, I was sitting there and it was the first time I ever saw the kind of emotional terrorism that they used yeah. to control the crew, mm -hmm. right? You know, and just just prior to that, I'd asked that script supervisor, "How come none of you guys ever want to be a director?" I mean, they they went and hired me, but it's like mm -hmm. you guys have everything you need. You don't need. Why do you need me? And mm -hmm. she said, "Oh, well, because you can get in too much trouble being a director." Mm -hmm. And I thought that is so weird. Like like who's ever heard of such a thing? And so then I saw it firsthand when I got called in the office, and so right in the middle of. John Eastman's like really harsh and these two guys are like, Rrr! and Hans Uli Stolle is like, Rrr! and, and then Hans Uli Stolle looks over at me and he goes, and he winks. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, this is disgusting. He's just let me know that I'm not in trouble and that this is just this game they play mm -hmm. with the staff to keep them terrorized yeah. and, that, and that I'm one of the cool people. So he's just gonna wink at me. But it, 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 I think it was also intended for them mm -hmm. to teach me the lesson that this is how you're supposed to treat the crew up here. Mm -hmm. And I went through a lot of soul searching at that point as to whether I should leave or not, because mm -hmm. I thought that was so disgusting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't leave because one of the reasons was I was really worried about what would happen to those guys because they were, they were in a lot of trouble and then we got a film done and they weren't in trouble anymore. So it's anyway. barbaric. Yeah, this, it really this, is. It really so is. Sad. This is, this is why I said, are they making more enemies? Because eventually these people who are bombarded with such psychoterrorism, it's a psychops, right? mentally, right. they, uh, you know, they'll get some pregnancy or medical condition and they'll ask to leave. <laughs> but the real reason they left, the, the, the bullying, the hazing, this is a culture of hazing and yeah, it's smashing horrible. and it's horrible. dominating and, you know, I want to sort of, I want to kind of finalize our, our thing together to tell you that okay. I got a similar letter to you. How strange. This was in 1990. You know, the letter you got saying, oh, yeah. you, you are should, ungrateful yeah. for all we did for you. And you yeah, owe us $750,000 yeah. yeah. for each, <laughs> for each clause you I got I got one of those letters, and I often uh, not anonymous, right? right? Anonymous, not not saying who wrote it, and it said, "Karen, you start you you have to examine what you're doing. You are a friend of the Mother Church. You're looked up to as a class twelve. You you have to, 
and and so much of the wording it wasn't legal it wasn't from a lawyer like yours right. but it was can you just examine and look inside your soul do you really want to burn in blackness lifetime after lifetime going into the future now i'm look this email was sent in 99 i'm paraphrasing it but it had just it almost could have been written by the same person oh yeah yeah because it was just like look at yourself examine it think carefully before you move forward with this kind of conduct think of think of your elongated future of eternal blackness yeah it's the same person. mentality huh it's the same mentality. It's not How the same person. funny that years later, yeah, it I might know. have been yeah. the same person. I speculated on who sent me that. I didn't respond. Yeah, so they, did, they didn't sign it? It was anonymous? No, it was anonymous. Just, oh, mine mine was, was from a very specific person. Oh, Catherine Fraser? Yeah, Kathy Fraser, yeah. She's Kathy not a Fraser. lawyer, but she plays one on TV. Hey, yeah. listen, so let's do some, uh, we got to, let's do some questions. Anybody okay. got a question, quick question in there? We got a super chat here from, uh, oh, who's this guy? Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Billionaire, Bob, Jeffrey, the Scientology Money Project says billionaire Bob Degan has donated in excess of greater than $400 million to Scientology. Does he rank on a par with Tom Cruise? Is money or fame more important to David Miscavige? Uh, uh, it depends. Uh, n the answer is no. He ranks under uh, Tom Cruise because nobody ranks as high as Tom Cruise because nobody knows who Bob Duggan is. Bob Duggan can walk down the street arm in arm with David Miscavige and no one would know who he is. But obviously Tom Cruise is a whole other phenomena. So in that ranking, and I wish I would have, I, I put a little bit of it on the thumbnail, but I wish I would have graphed it out. But you really have at the top, you have David Miscavige, then you have Tom Cruise, and then you have the super donors, or, uh, and then even below them, you have other celebrities. Unless those celebrities are like, you know, a Nancy Cartwright, who's given a, a mere $30 million. So, thanks for that, Jeffrey. I hope I answered that question. Let me see if we have any uh, any other questions over here. Uh, to the, to the, uh, we have a question for Karen. So Chuck Beatty wants to know, uh, Karen, what did you think about Miscavige for failing to get himself up to class 12? Greg Wilhair at least did get to class 12. <laughs> David Miscavige punched his PC violently as a youngster when he was 12 years old. This electrified St. Hill, I think the year was 1972. The whole Miscavige family was there from, from Philadelphia. And I don't know why David Miscavige lost his cool, but there was a little camera crew following him around as a child prodigy because this little camera crew were there to take photos for a proposed monthly magazine called An Afternoon at St. Hill. And... David Miscavige was being featured. Then this girl comes running out of the auditing room and David Miscavige is following her and she's doubled over, holding her stomach, sobbing. And it was a, a bomb <laughs> because St. Hill was the pinnacle of Scientology. There was no flag, there was no free winds. Everyone and all the Australians and other everyone went to St. Hill to do the old OT levels and so on. And Marlon Gelfand, who's still alive, she must be 90 something, was my intern supervisor. And she did roll call and she said, A very unfortunate incident occurred here. And I want you all to know that you are to bury this, not gossip about it, not talk about it. And in 48 hours, the Miscavige family fled East Grinstead and went back to Philadelphia. Miscavige, oh, and the film crew dissolved. There was no more magazines of afternoon at St. Hill. This, this was, how do you photograph and feature someone who punches their PC? So failed to get to <laughs> class 12. He couldn't even make it as class four. But right. that violent urge in his soul 
to punch occurred even when he was a 12-year-old auditor. I was the counselor of his mom, Loretta, and she, not in session, not session data, Miscavige was called Little Hitler in his own family. How do you call a child a Little Hitler? I'll tell you why. And I've talked to, I have my sources. When he got into a violent temper tantrum, he could punch even his own father, his mother, his siblings. He punched, he would be out of control in some violent frenzy. This occurred as he was growing up. Then he couldn't control himself even when he was a so-called counselor at St. Hill, punched his own PC. And then there's a continuity of punch. We told the, we told the broken note and, and, and he punched and punched and punched. So there's something within Miscavige where you dominate by violence and overwhelm. What is he running on others to be the oligarch? He punches violently, although listening to you, Mitch, he's now, uh, he's now using proxies to do the violence. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, plus I think the, the I think possibly he's under a certain level of restraint uh, because, you know, the gold, th that environment, you know, once you're inside that environment and you've got the security and you've got the, the, the you know, it's fenced and electrified fences and all that kind of stuff, it feels safe for people to get away with that kind of shit. But now he's much more out in public. So I, I don't think he's doing that so much. I think he's still traumatizing people emotionally. I mean, I saw it when I was at SP, I saw him do that to people in meetings. And, and so I think there's still a lot of emotional verbal abuse. I don't know that he's punching people so much, but I don't know. He could be. I don't know. Well, you're not with him. You're not with him. These yeah, no, I'm not. But, yeah, but I also know that if I, I think it'd be harder to get away with that at Flag or at St. Hill or at SMP. Um, I think it would be harder. Maybe for the him. lawyers have told him this can warrant lawsuits. Yeah, it could, could this, possibly. Yeah. If anyone goes to law enforcement. Um, yeah, yeah. This is when you, when you, <laughs> when you punch someone, it's assault and battery. Right. This is right. arrest territory. Knock it off. Right. Right. So he wouldn't right. be doing it because he woke up one morning and decided, you know what? It's unethical to just beat and punch people. Right. I'm going to be a good boy. Right. No, no, no. no. Uh, yeah, no, he I agree with you 100%. I, I think his change of environment in terms of being away from gold ha has um, put him in more of, uh, even though he's hiding out, but it's a, he's more public now. Mm -hmm. Even being at, 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 at uh, Flag and so forth, he's more public. So he doesn't have a Mitch, place. Mitch, he's hardly public at all. No, but he's, I mean. But other he's, than an, SMP, where is the public of David Miscavige? Well, I, I think, no, you're right. It, uh, maybe that's the wrong choice of words. But what I mean is within the walls of that confine, like you, you bet there's people at Flag that see him. He can stay within that compound. He, he can move freely from the Fort Harrison over to the Flag building and then, you know, hide in the back of a limo and get driven to wherever he's living if he's not living in his apartment in the flag building. So I'm saying, but within the walled sanctuary of, of Vatican City, people would see him. You hear what I'm saying? Within the, the walled uh, security of SMP, people would see him, you know, and the people would be called into meetings with him at ASI. So we're, but we're at gold. Like he doesn't have a place outside of gold where he can, hold people in, in like a prison. You get what I'm saying? Well, he used free winds as a prison ship. Yeah, that's true. He could he could always send people there and use it as a prison, Put have them working in the machine room, whatever it is. We've used the, the word room. SMP a lot. Oh, yeah. Sorry and, about that. And when you do the description, SMP is Scientology Media Productions, right. which is a campus in sort of East Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. And that's where David Miscavige runs the cult from. Yeah. SMP simply means Scientology Media Production Campus. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's the old KCET uh, campus yes, that they that purchased they and they spent $100 million renovating it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah.
so I think that's I think that's it. Um, to, to the, Great. To the, yeah, this was really an unbelievably fascinating conversation. I really appreciate it, Karen. I know you and I are going to be doing more of this. Yes. Uh, and thank My you all. For, uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, we have another one planned that is, is very interesting. I'm not going to even say what it is, uh, <laughs> but we, we've been talking about another one. So I, I really appreciate you all stopping by. Thanks for the comments. Don't forget, go visit my page, uh, uh, Scientology of the Big Lie. Also, go see, uh, Karen, but visit Karen's page. I, I'm sorry, I don't have to, um, I, I didn't. Surviving Scientology. Yeah, yeah, Surviving Scientology, but I didn't, I didn't bring the pages up. That's sorry. okay. Yeah, That's sorry about that. We, we, all know, okay. we all know where to find you. And please go to my page and 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 go to the the community page and and let's let's get some cop captions going on that wonderful photo. Karen, thank you so much. I discovered and that Mitch in my Google Maps when we went to dinner the other night. I discovered <laughs> that Mitch lives fifteen minutes. Google Maps told me, he, yeah. Mitch lived fifteen minutes away from me. Yeah, and yeah. as a final sentence before we end. I want to thank Mitch's graciousness and kindness. He called me from his heart and apologized to me for helping to contribute on hate videos made on me when he was <laughs> when he was in. Yeah, I, did I that. thought that was so yeah. so sweet. It just so it really touched me, Mitch. I just Imagine someone fleeing and then coming out and, you know. So thank you for that, Mitch. You're, You're welcome. Dear, uh, was, dear to you. my heart. And thank I look forward much, to Karen. the pumpkin party we've organized for. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be great. Yeah, that's <laughs> the for. upcoming party yeah. that we'll be going to. I'm going to, going to talk to you a lot there. Okay, okay great. I'll see you there and see you all soon. Bye bye. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh.